a case before you leave. Uh, she's a tough woman, I'll tell you. Uh, Sydney Foreman uh, works out of, out of Canadian. Well, out of Tampa, actually. Out of Tampa, mm -hmm. yep. She's of Texas, Tampa. girl. She's okay. Hey, hey, girl. Hey, girl. Uh, she's got a sign-in sheet, and she'd like to do that. And then they also, I know this will be said, but if you've got some little issue or something you want to follow up on, if you'll make sure you get her a card, she's real good at following up. So. Well, thank you, Mr. Messenger. Uh, of course, this is kind of a day of a little bit of uh, recollection of 9 11, and so it just seems appropriate to have Representative Ken King here today to talk to us about a few things that's going on with the legislature and how he works effectively. Uh, he, he represents the 88th district, and there are 17 counties in that district that he has to represent and it just diagonally it's 450 miles but if you drove through all those communities to get to the right spot i think it's uh, 1200 miles so about 1200 miles it takes for him to just cover his area so you know and that's rural of an area and he has to go down there to austin to try, uh, fight those urban areas it's uh, it's a he's a strong man and he cares about kids <laughs> and he cares about communities and he cares about rural Texas. He's just done a great job representing us uh, and I appreciate him so much. So before I let him talk, uh, we're gonna let Mrs. Heddington and Ms. Wayne, would y'all kind of give him a gift uh, from Mule Shoe here? Oh, thank you, Mrs. For you, thank you for coming. Oh, absolutely, oh, that's awesome, thank you. You can, wear, you can take that to your Canadian football game. I, 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 I tell you what, I will wear it Friday night when we stomp the Perry Can Rangers. <laughs> Thank you all for being so here. Uh, let's give uh, Rest of King a round of applause. Well, I think I know most of you, but I am Kent King. I'm your state representative. And you first elected me in 2012, 13 was my first session, we just finished our fourth session, the 86th legislature. And um, I am running again, and before I get started on the 86th legislature, I think it's important, so I don't, I would feel remiss if I didn't bring this up, it's the first thing I do at every one of these things. I'm running again, this is a redistricting year. This is uh, every 10 years, but all legislatures redraw their maps. Those maps determine the lines, your uh, state representative, your state senator, your congressman, and your U.S. senator, um, that those lines depend on who they represent. The last time we redistricted, House District 88 was created under a map that 160,000 people population was required to have a rural district. So if you've never looked at the district map that we, we would, my House District is under, you should take a look. It's 17 counties and it stair steps from the northeastern corner of the Panhandle all the way down to Yoakum County. We go across the um, east side of Emerald and the west side of Lubbock. It's a big diagonal. And I'm telling you this so you understand the challenge we have going into redistricting this time. Census estimates say that Texas has grown so much that we're going to have to have 200,000 people now to make a rural district. Our population has not grown in the last 10 years in House District 88. This is going to be a challenge to say the least. But I'm running again because it is so important that Muleshoe has rural representation. Nothing wrong with my colleagues in Amarillo or Lubbock if you were to get gobbled up in their map, but they don't need you. They don't need your five or 600 votes um, every two years. I do. I show up, I'm accountable to you, I, I appreciate and respect all everything you, you guys do in your small towns and the, the city people just have a different way of looking at it. I think running in a redistricting year is without a doubt one of my greatest civic duties since I've been elected. And I want you to remember how important this next election is. And if you know somebody that says, I don't vote or my vote doesn't count, just grab them by the ear and take them to the polling booth and make sure they vote. The other thing I want to tell you, and, and you know, if you if you are um, a Democrat, thanks for coming. If you uh, are not, this is very important for you. In the last midterm election, the Texas House lost 12 seats, and mainly in Dallas and Houston, the urban centers. 
and well, the 12 Repo Republican seats. We're down to eight Republican seats. If we lose eight Republican seats, the Texas House could turn Democrat. That is also very bad for redistricting because the urban Democrats sure don't care about rural representation. They want all the, all the votes in the urban center. So without, without mincing words here, if you look at the last midterm election when the Texas House lost 12 seats, we almost lost all statewide elected Republicans until rural Texas came in with a million votes that were nearly all for the GOP. And that's honestly what kept Texas red. So if you are a Democrat and you're crossing party lines because you like me, I love you back. I am a Republican. I want to see Texas stay red. Please vote. Okay, enough of that. Going forward, I just want to tell you a few things about the 86th legislative session. We are going to talk a lot about schools because that's all we did this time. And so that was House Bill 3 was the big bill. But number one, we passed a budget. The budget was $251 billion this time. Largest budget the state has ever passed. It was big like this for a lot of reasons. We had the money to do it because the only thing our Constitution makes us do is two things. First, your legislature must balance a budget in 140 days every other year. And if we don't do it in 140 days, session never ends. That is a constitutional mandate. So the only other thing our state mandate or the state mandated by the Constitution is we will provide free public education. Doesn't say a thing about home, home schools, sheriff's offices, vouchers of any kind. Doesn't say anything like that. Article 7 is the only financial mandate the state has. We will pay for public schools every time. If everything else goes away, your public schools are going to get funded by the state at some level. So, going beyond that, so what we do this time? Well, we put $11 billion additional into public education in a lot of ways. It went to teacher pay. Um, it went to early childhood, it went to the retired teachers, uh, it went to the pension fund, it went to uh, TRS care, it went um, to mental health. But at the same time, we put $5 billion of that went to buy down property taxes. The statute calls for, as property taxes rise, the state's share of public education goes down. It's not anything the state necessarily does intentionally. But think about it like this. Back in 1993, the last time the state put considerable resources into public education, number one, we had a court order to do so. We did not have a court order to do House Bill 3. We took that on, on upon ourselves. The other thing to consider, at that particular time in the 90s, oil and gas production was 38% of our gross state product. Today, it accounts for about nine. That's how diverse our state is. So, Give you another little fun fact to tell you how much we change from our dependence on the oil and gas industry to pay for our schools and our highways, everything else, um, for the for the most part. We um, in 2015, the oil and gas industry lost 400,000 oil and gas related jobs, 400,000, and still Texas had the lowest unemployment in the nation. So what I, what I'm telling you, as oil and gas fluctuates like it tends to do, just like farm products or in all commodities. We, we do this. The state tends to maintain uh, and in fact grow because of pharmaceutical, medical, IT, manufacturing, all of the things that have taken the place of farm and ranch products and oil and gas. So property taxes are continuing to rise. Even if things are depressed here in the urban centers where the people are, we continue to grow. That caused a situation where the state's share of public education had got all the way down to 36% at one time. After House Bill 3, it's back up to 45%. House Bill 3 did so much, it's hard for me to explain it all in one meeting because the bill's 400 pages long. But I'll tell you just a couple of things, and, and please remember, I spent a year on the School Finance Commission before we did House Bill 3. House Bill 3 was a collaborative effort that came before the commission and certainly after. But the commission sent 38 recommendations to the legislature. And out of those 38 recommendations, that's how we crafted House Bill 3. The most significant, a couple of the most significant changes on how we fund schools 
Number one came from the old system, chapter 41 and 42. We had property wealthy districts and property poor districts. Well, I'm telling you, the biggest flaw in that system is we had a lot of poor kids living in either district that were missing out on educational opportunities because we were funding zip codes. We don't do that now. We threw chapter 41 and 42 in the trash. We wrote chapters 48 and 49. We are moving to a system to fund based on student need. And I think that's so important because those of you that have listened to me for the last six or eight years have always heard me say, every child deserves an equal educational opportunity. And if we're not giving it to them, then we're not doing our job and we're not following our state constitution. The other significant change in funding came by moving from a prior year value system to a current year value system. Now, there were some school districts that lost some money because of that. But what happened is, these prop mostly the property wealthy districts, they depended on what they called lag money. So prior year values, they would send their, their money into the state, their Robin Hood money or recapture money in. Well, so the state would take it, and then they would send them a portion of it back. Well, they called that lag money. And if you were in one of those property wealthy districts, you, you really needed the lag money. But that, that's about almost $2 billion. And when we decided to make the, when we made that decision to move to current year values, we took that $2 billion and plowed it back into the system for every school. The, the facts are, the numbers don't lie, that helped 75% of school districts. And it helped 69% of kids. I don't want to hurt anybody. That's why I voted to give our education commissioner unprecedented latitude to make sure nobody loses for the next two years because that wasn't the goal of House Bill 3. But you can't argue if changing the system helps 75% of the districts, you kind of got to go that way. So that being said, we, did a, we put a lot of resources into the things I've mentioned. I think we're on the right track. Did we fix it all? Absolutely not. But we, we did our best to address um, TRS, TRS care, early childhood, <clears throat> teacher pay, incentive pay. Um, I, and, I, and, we can, I hope some of you ask me some questions about some of this so we can get a little more in detail. But uh, I should probably move on. Mental health was a hard one. It's always a hard one. We spent about seven and a half billion dollars overall on mental health. But for Senate Bill 11 called for about $220 million that went into schools on the heels of the Santa Fe shooting. Most of that money is earmarked to hire counselors and mental health professionals for our schools. Some of it is there for hardening our schools. I don't, I, I'm not one that believes you should turn your schools into prisons. I think I personally, for Ken King, I want to know why kids are shooting kids. And and until we add counselors and mental health professionals and train our classroom teachers to identify these troubled kids, we're not going to find that out. And that's what Senate Bill 11 was about. We, I have, a, I have like four pages here that I could go over, but I, I really want to get to the point that we talked about what you want to talk about. Um, I'm always looking for ways to cut costs and do away with unfunded, let me get that, I don't know. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I wasn't really going to answer you. So, but I'm always looking. I'm always looking for ways to cut costs and do away with unfunded mandates. And the best bills come from you. If you have a way to cut costs and a way to do away with an unfunded mandate, call me. I'm always your guy. But this particular one came from uh, Scott Harrell over at Sudan. Um, he was frustrated with having to take investment officer training. Uh, when he doesn't invest securities in anything but CDs. He doesn't invest his fund balance money, so why should he have to go to Austin every year at taxpayer expense and take a class that he's never going to use? And I agreed with that. So House Bill 293 did away with that training for city managers as well as um, school superintendents unless they're investing your tax dollars in a risky security. The uh, we worked on House Bill 667 was a was an interesting bill. Another one that came from the district. It came from the uh, county or the district attorney over in uh, Lamb County, Scott Say and his staff. Over there, there was a young lady named Melissa who was horribly abused by her uncle. And that going into it, it lasted about three days. It was horrific the stuff he did to this young woman. 
there's a crazy loophole in Texas law that because she was over 17, but under 18, and she was prohibited by law to be married to this man because of incest laws, it created a loophole where a jury could only give her perpetrator 20 years. That's, I don't know why anybody interpreted the statute that way, but um, I, I've worked on this bill for them, and they wanted it obviously changed where a jury could give this perpetrator life in prison, as they should, and now they can't. And I, it was the right thing to do. I was a little surprised that anybody would ask me that I needed to pass a bill like that. But one of the reasons I like it, and I like to talk about it, it is a shining example of how your state legislature is supposed to work. That was, I didn't know Melissa. I didn't know her situation. I never heard the story. Some local people, just like yourself, said this needs to be changed. They wrote the bill. They brought it to me. I clarified it and made it fit all the legal parameters. They did their job, I did my job, I got the Senate to do their job, and the governor signed it. That's how your state government's supposed to work. This is a collaboration. I can represent all of you so much better when you tell me what you need. And don't be shy about it. I've got big shoulders and I've been chewed on before. So, But I, I was very proud of that bill for a lot of reasons. But when you get to see your government work like it's supposed to, it's pretty... Um, surreal when you compare it to Fox News or CNN. So I always like to talk about that one. And I'm just picking random. And mainly I do that just to show you I do do things down there that aren't necessarily public ed related. I work on a lot of different issues. But probably the last one that I will talk about was House Bill 3070. Um, I'm assuming, do you have any volunteer firefighters in here? First responders? No? Well, House Bill 3070, 70 had to do with what they call 2604 grants. The 2604 grant is a way your volunteer fire departments can get resources from the state. That grant is managed by the Texas Forestry Service under the AgriLife Extension Agency. What, it, what it's for is a rural department that needs equipment, can fill out a, the grant application, and eventually they will get their request filled. The problem with it is one thing the grant would not do is would not purchase uh, personal protective equipment, which I think is kind of crazy. Well, the number one, the number one killer of a volunteer firefighter today in the state of Texas is cancer, and it's largely because they have one set of bunker gear, and if they have to fight on multiple fires in a week, it all leaches into their skin, and they have no way of changing their clothes or, or washing them out because they also don't have extractors, which are giant washing machines for this stuff. Well, the 2604 grant would not cover those expenses. Now they do. The other thing it wouldn't cover, which I thought was really odd, and this came out of, of the, where I live in Canadian, we went through some horrible wildfires back in 2016. We lost over a million acres up there. And every department in the, in the top 26 counties just about was decimated. We lost tons of trucks, tons of equipment. Well, the 2604 grant would purchase a $150,000 fire truck, but it would not pay for a $5,000 transmission. So we still have equipment up there that's waiting to be replaced because, by the way, there's 22,000 stagnant grant, grant requests today. So we're, you know, get in line. So what happens, there's a reason for that. What happens is everybody knows the wheels of grants turn slow. So these bigger volunteer departments that can afford a grant writer, they just write grants every year, whether they need it or not, and they just keep stacking them up. Leads me to what I think is the most important change to that to the 2604 process. We put in statute any department that loses equipment in any county declared a, a disaster by our governor moves to the front of the line. If, if now that is the law today and so I'm hoping all of these departments I represent that have broke down equipment going back to 2016 can now move forward and do their job and have the equipment they need to protect all of us. I think it's common sense I think it, those kind of bills are my favorite. They're not controversial. You're not going to see me on Fox News beat my chest over them, but it's stuff that needed to be done. And that's that's how I like to represent. I don't I don't necessarily need a spotlight. I just need something good to work on and something that yeah, is beneficial for the people I represent. So beyond that, that's kind of my spiel. I've, uh, we do wear a lot of hats and uh, I, certainly am willing to talk about anything you want to talk about. 
99% of what I do is killing bad stuff. You know, uh, I don't think anybody in here would vote for me because they said, man, Kim Keith passed more laws for us to follow. Nobody wants that. We have enough laws. It's what I love about the people of House District 88. What you, most people tell me they care about, and I agree with, water education and transportation and stay out of our business. <laughs> Pretty much it. Not necessarily in that order, but that's what, that's what brings us all together from top to bottom. So I've tried to be that for you. I'm going to try to be that going forward. If I have not earned your vote in the last eight years, um, I would love the opportunity to do so. So please ask away. Well, Representative King, we appreciate yes, all that you did two uh, sessions ago, and then House Bill 3 this time was great. Uh, our teachers were able to get a 12% salary increase uh, right. due to your work, and the taxpayers got an 11 cent decrease on their taxes. So uh, that was pretty amazing what all you did. So we appreciate that. We also appreciate you working with us. We had that one uh, boundary uh, interlocal agreement deal that we were uh, issuing. Mm -hmm. uh, and so our school board feels pretty strong about that, but I appreciate your leadership on that. I think some of the other administrators may have some questions. Like I have a question. My name's Darla Mahon. I'm special ed director. Um, first of all, thank you for your continued support in education. I mean, it means a lot to us. Um, at first, I was concerned that gifted was left out of the... The GT? The GT mm -hmm. was left out of the funding, but special ed part, I am thankful that the new weighted allotments and the new basic allotments that we got. But my question is, how do schools such as our rural areas, how are we going to implement the dyslexic requirements? That is a great question, and I'm so glad you asked it. I'm not a good politician. <laughs> Honestly, that's going to have to play out. And we gave the commissioner like I say, unprecedented latitude that I'm going to, we, all of us, by next session, are going to have to reel him back in because you don't want a bureaucrat having that kind of, but we were trying to do no harm. So I can't answer you specifically on how it's going to be implemented. What I can tell you, if it's implemented in a way that is harmful for, to you and your students, I need to be your first phone call. Or actually, send up probably this your first phone call. But... <laughs> I, and and I'm not dodging it. There's just so much to that bill that I can't give you a specific. Well, yeah, because it's you know the screener, the referrals, yes, the assessment, the PEAMS data that you know for the new uh, funding for the PEAMS. But what I'm most concerned is the highly trained, the dyslexic specialist, and people in our communities having to provide that. Well, there's a number of waivers that the commissioner is writing right now. In fact, I have. Um, a file full of them um, in Austin that we've requested for different superintendents call and say hey this isn't going to work for us and right now we're working through that process this is going to be at least a two-year deal maybe maybe four you know when I change the law to uh, 75,600 minutes uh, I delayed implementation for four years because it took that long for schools to figure out how to operate in a different way and I don't see this being any different but I will tell you once again, if if it is if you feel like you're being forced to implement something that Mulshu ISD just has no resources to do, or, or, or whether it's people or financial, please call us and let us let us help you through the process. It's not no, it's limited, but yeah. well, sure. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. My name is Levi Tovar. I'm the principal at Dillman Elementary, which is pre-K through second. Uh -huh. First off, thank you for your help with funding full day pre-K. Mm -hmm. Um, my question is, do you know when the new kinder, first, and second grade assessments will be developed? Over the next two years. Okay. There's not, um, I don't think, uh, well, for one thing, the, the assessments, this goes back, that actually goes back to A through F, right? And the biggest problem with A through F is, well, the block problem. We don't want to. I, I think it's getting better. I'm, I'm working on it. I'm working. I shouldn't say there's only one. There's one. But, number one, three through eight, we're working, trying to develop a, um, a way to assess children three through eight that is not the test. The old system was 100% the test. We've got high school assessment down 
to being about half because there's other things you can assess. Three through eight, what we can do statewide is either the test or attendance. Well, we all know what we think about the test. And attendance is an assessment on the parent. It's not, a, it, you know, it doesn't help us. So, but um, I can tell you the House is committed, along with Commissioner Brown, to develop assessments for three through eight that aren't test related. You know, all S, which came after No Child Left Mind, all it actually says is any state that receives federal funding shall have a majority of their accountability system be a standardized test. It doesn't give a percentage. So if it's 50.000, whatever is the test, that's enough. We have to develop what's fair. And it's really hard because what's fair at Mule is not fair in Houston and vice versa. So I wouldn't stress too much about it. And I can tell you any assessment for pre-K and up is not going to be a test. We're not star testing three-year-olds. I can or I quit. If we, if we have to make three-year-olds take the star test, I'm leaving. So no, I, I, I think it's coming. I think you're going to see something from TEA, but we've got time to develop those, and there's a lot of uh, focus groups working on that right now that include um, people just like yourself. And, and if you'd like to be part of something like that, let us know. And I'll, I'll work with Commissioner Morath and see if I can get you or one of your colleagues from Yoshu in one of these groups where you've got some actual say so where that's going. Well, I'm Cindy Vassar. I'm the, president, uh, the principal of president. The principal at the high school. <laughs> she so, well be you? <laughs> I don't remember. You, you yelled at me last I time. I did not. <laughs> yes, yes. But you did address Fed funding. That was one of the things. And you did address it. So yeah. thank you for listening to that. Um, I will give you some, though, uh, praise on AWF. CCMR has helped the high school here. It helped with our rating, our accountability here in Milshew. So I do appreciate the changes that have been made with House Bill 22 mm -hmm. and, um, and the CCMR. But going back to House Bill 3, um, my teachers were ecstatic with their raise. I mean, we appreciate the, the funding changes y'all made uh, to help our staff and teachers. It helped our morale. Um, our te we have a good group of teachers, and it sure did help there. You've got a great school, and we it did. shows. Yes, sir. So what about the compensatory ed funding? Can you explain that to us? Uh, yeah, kind of. <laughs> Probably not as well as you can. Uh, you know, but we say, well, what I can tell you is we saved the funding or, and actually put more money into compensatory okay. because it drove more dollars to more schools. Same as with, with special ed funding um, being, being the only weight left in the small mid sized school adjustment. We tried to put dollars into the different weights we kept that drive more dollars equally throughout the state. I know that's probably not what you're looking for, but I, I mean, you're going to have to give me a little more. Well, the like with the census block, uh -huh. and uh, basing it, you know, on where people live and they're economically disadvantaged in that area. How many own homes? How many are sure. single families? Well, some things well, that, like that. And that is all. That all goes back to what I was saying, where the the entire focus of House Bill Three was trying to get to a system where we fund student need, and and the compensatory <laughs> funding is is a, uh, it's a big part of that. But you know, let's talk, talk a little bit about um, on on the teacher on the teacher pay. Um, some of the things that came out of that school finance commission that are very very important, and, and I don't think they're disputable disputable at all. About eighty percent of a child's success comes from being around high quality teachers, especially in the early childhood. We know that. Um, reading on third grade level by third grade. That it is almost a direct correlation with our literacy and our prison rates. We have to have our kids reading on grade level. Oh, as far as paying teachers more, I, I'm for it, <coughs> always for it. But for but the reasoning behind it, and those of you who aren't in the school business, uh, but are but are employers and and looking for for educated people to come in your workforce, this is so important. Over half of our teachers today are on an alt cert because no profession is losing new recruits faster than school teachers. They're losing them between um, year three and five. Well, between three and five is when a new teacher becomes a great teacher, usually. It takes, you know, there's a learning curve, it's like everything else. So
So we tried to put some money in that will kick in through the incentive fund right. in year three and five. I didn't say we fixed anything. I'm just saying we're going the, going the right direction. The other thing we did it, on, for our retired teachers, we made the pension actuarially sound for the first time. We gave a 13th check. That's one of the reasons young teachers are leaving. They're about year five, they go, well, gosh, my mom was a teacher and her retirement's horrible. I'm not staying in this. Or her insurance is bad. Um, you know, so we try to take care of our retired teachers in that way. Insurance is a big deal. And I've got a plan. Anybody want to hear it? Yes. 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 All right. And I've actually pitched this to the Retired Teachers <laughs> Association and, and everybody and um, TASB and um, TASA and the governor. So don't shoot me. Let me finish because it sounds a little scary. I want to take Texas out of the retired teacher insurance business. In fact, I want to do away with um, t um, TRS care altogether. And here's how I want to do it. I want to take the 65 and older crowd and I want to give them a big enough COLA that they can roll off and buy Medicare Part D and they can afford it. 39,000 of that group rolled off of TRS care last year. If you want to know why TRS care premiums are going up, it's because it's such a bad insurance product. All the retirees that can't get on Medicare are rolling off. Once they roll off, they can't ever get back on. So guess what's happening to your risk pool? It's doing this. So. Take care of our retirees, let them go to Medicare. We got a problem with our 55 to 65 year olds. There has to be a runway to get them off. It just takes money. And then I want to take our active teachers and I want to put them in ERS. Not your pension, just insurance. Here's the difference. You're going to talk about a sustainable teacher pay raise. Average family of four, mom and dad are both teachers, two kids. I've seen estimates anywhere from 12 to 1500 a month cost the insurance. Same two teachers, two kids, cost of insurance, I mean the ERS is about 400 to 500, somewhere in that range. That's a pay raise. And I don't care how you look at it, that is a pay raise and that is a sustainable pay raise. What does that cost? Well, the estimates are kind of all over the board right now. And so I'm giving you broad strokes, I'm not giving you, I'm not, and I can't and give you the deep, give you details on it because we're still working out the plan. But I think, you know, it, it could cost five billion dollars to do this. The state's liability for the next 10 years just to keep TRS care going, which by the way, it was never built to be sustainable. The state never put a funding mechanism in place to sustain um, teacher insurance. But if we decide to do that, this last time we had to put a little over 300 million in it to keep it, the next five years we'll put over a billion dollars of biennium into it. So we could spend five billion now and save 20 over the next decade or two. I mean. And actually fix something that's broken while we have the money. I, I think it's I think it's the right thing to do, not only for our teachers and our retired teaching personnel, but I think it's um, fiscally responsible for the state of Texas. We can't keep dumping billions of dollars down that rat hole and then not get anything for it. So that's just something that that's something our office will be working on and betting over the next uh, well year and a half before we go back to next session. I did file a bill to do this last session. It wasn't the right time, but on the heels of what we did in, in 2019 by making the pension actuarially sound and giving the retirees a 13th check, we're in a better spot to move forward with something like this. Surely you all want some talk about other schools. <laughs> yes, sir. No Nusser Junior High Principal here in town. Nope. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is actually uh, leading kind of the immigration, and uh, I don't want to really get it into that, but I just want to make a point of how uh, being a border state and the number of kids that are coming into our country that are non-English speaking students. Um, uh, some of them even non-Spanish speaking students. Uh, so they're placed within our schools, which were required by the Department of Education, federal government, to get those kids enrolled in schools. Mm -hmm. Everybody in the room believes in educating kids. That's why we're in the business we are. You know, My question is, uh, we get a reprieve with the ADF grading system for one year for those kids that are non-English speakers. After that, they start counting towards accountability. Mm -hmm. Many of them are coming to us 13, 14 years old, and the last time they were educated, was second grade. I'm wondering if anybody's ever thought about is there a way of writing some type of bill to uh, 
give relief to school districts that have these type of kids coming into their district uh, and, and still be held accountable. Uh, we're not worried well, and, about and, the accountability piece. Here's the here's problem. I, I know I think about it all the time. And it's a big focus of mine, particularly because I represent school districts like Milshi. Listen, if you have to give freshmen a test and in, and your freshman enrollment say you got 10 of these kids, yeah, it tanks your A through M. A Houston ISD that has 100,000 kids, you know, 1,000 kids that have to take it, it's not, it's a ratio issue. And yes, we think about it, we're working on it all the time. Right now, the best I can tell you that we've got done is um, a waiver process when you have that situation arise. And and I've, I've been successful in, a, in getting school districts a waiver on or for special circumstances like that. It's a little bit difficult to say, well, this school has to be accountable, but this one doesn't. So it, it's, it's tricky how you write the bill. But oh, I know exactly what you're saying. And when you get in that situation, we need to fix it. And I, I'm all ears if you've got a fix for it. Um, but until we get one, when you get in that situation, uh, make sure I know it, make sure my office knows it, and we will, we'll work with you to, to make, because the whole intent of the A through F system, the, the reason I voted for it in the first place, nobody liked the old system either. I mean, and nobody understood it, frankly. A through F on its face is easy to understand because everybody understands A through F. What is making it so difficult is all these different domains. How do they compete? How do they look in Yoshu versus Lubbock? And how do they look? And, you know, frankly, like I told you on the minutes bill, I fought as hard as I could and I lost the vote to delay implementation until 2022, for, to your point, to when we could actually have measurement tools for three through eight, to your point, to we could actually figure out what do you do in these circumstances when you get a vast amount of kids that frankly cannot ever pass the test in a year. You know, those are all questions that have to be addressed before we have a fair accountability system. And I, and I get it, I, I, don't have, I, I don't have the magic bullet for you, um, I know where I might put it if I had it, but we won't go there. <laughs> but I'm with you. I, I don't know how to answer you any better. Well, I, and it even gets tougher for like at the high school where those kids are required graduation credits. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I can tell you that the United States Army, for example, tests kids in the ASVAB and you test very highly in linguistics. Mm -hmm. uh, I can assure you that nine months later you're going to know some foreign language. Mm -hmm. But that's what they do for nine months, is from 8 o'clock in the morning until 5 o'clock in the evening, they learn Russian, or they run, learn whatever language it is. Well, you know, Houston, and we don't get the opportunity to do that with a kid yeah. that speaks no English, and we have them 45 minutes a day, and an English teacher saying, and then in two years, we're going to test you. Well, you know, you get to Houston, and Houston ISD speaks something like 239 languages right now. Yeah. I mean, in, inside the school district, and we do. We have 100,000 kids a year hitting our school roles. More and more of them don't speak English. It costs more to educate them. You know, when we, when, when we, you used to hear Rick Perry talk about the Texas miracle all the time, and it has been. You know, we're, you know, I explained to you how our, G, our gross state product was so heavily dependent 30 years ago on oil and gas, and now it's down to nine. Well, that came with the cost. When you bring all these other industries into this state, now you get not only do we get the immigrant population coming in. We get the Californians coming and the Yankees, and they bring their politics with them. Personally, I think if they're going to vote that way, they need to go home. But <laughs> I can't. You can't get. You got the good with the bad here. You know, I, I. It's awesome to see our state grow and be so diverse in that one industry where where, where Texas is never going to look like Oklahoma again. You know, when oil and gas goes down, Oklahoma tanks. They quit paying their teachers all together. Oil and gas goes down in Texas, we just grab another gear and keep going now, which is not good for me because I'm an oil and gas guy. But it is great for the state, but it does come with a trade-off. We get a bunch of people that don't think like we do. And um, I, I frankly don't know what to do about it. I think maybe you should have to be a Texan for a decade before you can vote. <laughs> 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 or maybe, maybe, maybe there's a grace period. <laughs>
<laughs> Let me just tell you, some of us wandered around in the desert for 30 years and we finally covered the promise. Amen. 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 Representative King, I have another question on assessment. Part of House Bill 3906, there's a paragraph in there that talks about assessing the assessment. What's the intent of that? Assessing the assessment is to make sure we're not asking trick questions. I mean, that's that was the goal of the whole thing is, you know, there was a lot of talk last session about and, and I don't know why all of a sudden people are, are jumping on this. We knew this when the STAR test came out. The complaint when I was on the school board, which wasn't a complaint for me, but the reason we had to get rid of the tax test is we were we, it wasn't telling us anything. We were testing just whatever we thought they knew, which was basically grade level. Now the complaint about the STAR test is we're testing kids two grades above what, you, what they've actually been through in your classrooms. And it's a problem. Well, this session we had a lot of uh, a lot of heated conversations about that very thing and about the trick questions and I, I know I probably told you all this story but I it, and I tend to agree this whoever's writing that assessment we need to be grading that assessment and teachers that are actually teaching the classes need to grade the assessment because if it, I don't want kids to fail I that should never be the goal of the state I think we got in a conversation for a lot of years where we were tr certain people in your state government were trying to privatize <laughs> education and I think I think that crowd was trying their best to set kids up to fail to make the argument for privatization that train has left the station we're not even talking about that anymore so yes the assessment needs to be right but my assessment story that I know I've told you some of you before was my daughter a senior when she's in the sixth grade and she was doing her start test prep and it was math and it was probability problems and I'm telling you I do not like math and I'm not good at it and I particularly got bad at it when they combined it with English and start putting letters in it <laughs> I got lost but I'm trying to help my daughter with her homework and it was one of those questions Cindy had five yellow marbles three yellow or, or red ones and so many green ones and she shook the bag three times and what's her chance of we actually had the stuff to do it and we did the experiment best two out of three and I said, well, you know, we've got a yellow marble. That's got to be the answer. And so I was so proud of it. We get, she gets home the next day. And I said, uh, well, how are we doing? And she said, we got it wrong, Dad. You got it wrong. I, okay. I never did get a math question right. And she told me, she said, um, um, what? She said, you are on public education. You're supposed to be able to fix this. I said, well, you don't understand how this works. I said, you know, I can't fix it. And she said, then you're just no good. You know, you can't <laughs> fix this star problem. And so I called Governor Perry. And I said, Governor, my daughter has something to tell you. And she said, star test sucks. I said, don't <laughs> say that to the governor. <laughs> but she did. And you know what? It didn't help. But we have made progress. And assessing the assessment is the right thing to do. Because if we don't assess the assessment, we are setting kids up to fail. So I, I listen. Every piece of legislation down there is confusing. Any of y'all read the 11 um, prompts that are on the ballot? I, that are going to be on the November ballot? I promise you the language on those is confusing as well. So do you think they'll replace the committees that are already in place for the assessment? Will there be a new committee? I do. And I, I think we'll start hearing more about that in the spring. We're going to have a lot of interim, we have some interim charges to address that and but none of that will start till after Christmas. Has there been any talk about using the ACT and SAT as far as measuring high school progress rather really than the story mm -hmm. test? Yeah, I filed that bill three times now. And um, the reason it won't pass and honestly legally it cannot pass in Texas because ACT and SAT are tied directly to Common Core. And Texas is not a common core state. We have our Texas essential skills that we've spent billions putting out there. Now the other test, um, TSI, mm -hmm. yes, that's the Texas test that we require kids to take. So if you add TSI to that statute, you could pass it. I've been told um, by legal counsel that the um, Department of Education would strike it down because we are not eligible to use ACT and SAT as 
Now, even though colleges, that's all they want. They don't care about the KSI. But because Texas will not accept Common Core, we cannot be eligible from the federal government standpoint. And here, listen, the federal government's, uh, I hear it all the time, let's get rid of the test altogether. Well, we just talked about ESSA and what that requires from a testing standpoint. Or that equates to in dollars, is about $10 billion in federal funding to the state every year for public ed. If we quit testing, say, you know what, federal government, go away. Well, that's great for a Canadian Texas. It's probably not as good for a mule shooter. You know, I don't, you know, the school I used to be on board, we never got any of those AYP dollars. We never got any federal assistance, so I didn't care what they said. But I, I would suggest a lot of people do, I know they do in my district, and, and frankly, as far as the cost savings, if we lose the $10 billion a year by not testing, it costs about $90 million a year to administer the test statewide. So from a dollar and cent standpoint, what we have to do on that test is make it count for as little as possible and get to the place that we're using it as the tool it was intended to be. Just a measurement stick. Not the end-all, be-all. You know, Kel Selger had, a, had a, a great bill a few sessions ago and he's had to extend it every time and I don't know why we can't make it permanent, permanent law. And it's the one that if a kid just that is ready to graduate and they're, that, you know, they passed all their coursework but they just can't pass the test, an art committee can get together, y'all know the bill I'm talking about? And we have to redo that bill every time because the Senate makes him put a sunset date on it. That is a wonderful bill. That's what we ought to be doing. You know, same deal. I, we passed a bill out of the House this time that I saw passed um, under the Obama administration and it got struck down as unconstitutional. And what it said was, if you pass the start, kid pass the start test in the third grade. They don't have to take it again in the fifth grade. They pass it in the fifth grade, they don't have to take it again in the eighth grade. Sounds like common sense to me because we spend, a, I know kids that can, can whip those tests out in a lot of districts because for whatever reason, I'm not picking a fight here. They get a little extra recess time so we can work on the kids that have to have it. Well, I always felt as a parent of a kid that could pass the test, well, why is my kid missing out on the instruction? Or why are we making them take it? If, if, if they don't need it, why are we, why are we forcing on them? Anyway, that bill was struck down as unconstitutional twice under No Child Left Behind. We passed it out of the House this time. Uh, again, and the Senate killed it. I don't, I don't know. Common sense. In the Senate, man, it's tough. <laughs> Mr. King, I have a concern about your abortion voting record. Okay. So two years ago, you voted for uh, late-term abortions on babies with disabilities. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. No, I didn't. Let's tell the truth. We're going to talk about it. This is well documented. No, it's not well documented. Let's talk about what that bill did. And that was not a bill that did anything. It was an amendment. Mm -hmm. gotcha. And what the amendment said. And what they said, it wasn't babies with disabilities. It was babies with severe fetal abnormalities. Abnormality. Yes. There we go. You know what the definition of that is? It's babies that are developed without a spine. That's not true. Yes, it is. That's what it is. Abnormality can mean many things beyond no, a spinal problem. No, sir. It can mean a heart problem. No, sir. You're wrong. Sorry. I'm a doctor. I know a little bit about that. Hey, you know, I know what the statute says and why I voted the way I did. And the other thing is, it had to do with 20-week abortions after 20 weeks. Well, if you have to do that after 20 weeks, there is a reason. No, it's not. Murdering a baby is never a good reason. You know, if, if, it's, if it's going to be born without a spine. And the other thing it could do is undo 40 years of great abortion work in Texas as far as pro-life because the Supreme Court will strike that down. And I did not vote to abort Guess they, what? The Supreme Court doesn't get to strike down the state pass law. They do. Of course they do. Federal statute. Show me that in the Constitution. It happens every day. Only the state law the state. is always state law is always subject to federal com federal confirmation. It is. That's not true. That's not the Constitution. <laughs> Doctor, I'm sorry. You're going to have to agree to disagree. And, and then this year you voted you voted against an amendment that would have um, clarified that cities and counties can uh, ban abortion. You were one of only two Republicans that voted against that amendment. It was Amendment 23 and Senate Bill 22. Senate Bill 22. That was the, the only pro-life bill that passed was the bill that... There was a number of pro-life bills that actually passed. And I voted for... I, 
I voted, for, I voted for Senate Bill 22. I'm talking about Amendment 23. I can't. And who brought the amendment? Stickland. There's probably a good reason right there. So your animosity against Stickland that you vote no. for abortion? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. So why did you vote against it? I don't even remember what the amendment did. It, it's, it stated this very one, simple one line sentence. Um, this clarifies, I can't quote exactly, but it clarifies that cities and counties can still um, ban abortion. I, I, there was probably, did the amendment pass? Yes, overwhelmingly. You and Sarah Davis were the only Republicans who voted against it. I can't have, I honestly didn't have to go back and look. I don't know. But I did vote for Senate Bill 22. I, I noticed you did vote for the final bill. I, I voted for the final bill. Yeah, and my, my pro-life record, by the way, is outstanding. You may not agree with an amendment I didn't support, but that's fine. You know, that, that's great. Put your, the filing deadline is December 9th. I'm running for office again, uh, but I have a 100% pro-life record. No, you don't. I do. We just talked about two votes that were evil bill votes that you made. Well, you know, I think you you have misconstrued what I'm about and what I support. Representative King, yes. I actually had another question. Okay. Um, so I'm the principal at the 3 through 5 campus, mm -hmm. and this kind of follows up with what Mr. Nusser talked about earlier. Um, but we do have a large influx of kiddos coming from Guatemala and Honduras, mm -hmm. and, and so kind of just what he talked about, you know, we only have that year of, um, you know, mm -hmm. uh, basically waiver to not be uh, having those kids included on our accountability. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that, that you can look at doing down the road to, to change that, or, or can we get some kind of system where those kids have more time to develop that academic language so that they can be successful on those STAR tests? Once again, we're working on that. And I, and I think, um, unfortunately, get, getting a waiver is not a good answer to that long term. But I, I think when you get that, you know, I had the situation in another school district a while back, and it ha actually happened to be kids from Guatemala that came into a small school as 10th graders. And most people believe they would drop out the next year. But after they tanked the accountability system, and we were able to grant a waiver for that school district moving forward, or I say we, TEA was. And I think we will, we will continue to work through that end. It's, it's difficult because, once I say it, once again, it's a ratio thing. If you've got 10 kids, that could tank your accountability. The 10, 10 in Lubbock ISD doesn't really affect their rating. So I, I, don't, I don't necessarily want to leave certainly don't want to leave any child behind on, on, and we, and we don't on education. Well. I, I know you don't. But, and so I, that's why I'm saying the waiver deal is not, is not a good option long term because I'm afraid that's what we're doing. How we address it, small school versus big school, is something that's being um, worked on right now. And if, if you have an idea, I would love to see a bit Okay. I really Can I will. make a comment? You yes. you made a comment earlier about it taking three to five years to develop a great teacher. Mm -hmm. That comment could also go to students they developing mean, academic, academic language, language. At this point. social language. I have no, I, I I could not agree with you more. I could be in a lot of times, and and you know once again that goes to failing schools. Yeah. How long do you go to school? Actually, have a failing grade before you step in. Because if you let it go three years, a, a freshman in high school, their career is over. We can't do we can't do that. So and we love these kids that we're getting. Uh, I don't want that to be misconstrued at all. But right now, as of Monday, just at the DeShazo three three five campus, we have twenty three what we're calling newcomers, mm -hmm. new to the country that have no language and no educational background that we're working with. That's, and, and, you know, and, and so we and have a significant number of students. Well, and, and you know, back to A through F, I, I think we have made incredible strides on not punishing the school on that situation. You know, I, I remember uh, my first district director, she is a fourth grade teacher, and I, she had a student that had came, came to fourth grade and the kid couldn't read or write anything. Well, by the end of the semester, the child had written her essay. Well, to me, that's a success. That's a huge success to the state of Texas and the federal government. That was a failure. And we are trying to reverse that course. I, it's uh, it's incredibly challenging, though, to you know, to still have accountability, but not take it away 
um, and, and then leaving the local control aspect in. And, and it was to your point earlier on the assessment for the younger ages. And I, would, I really do want your input. If, if we don't allow the locals to develop these assessments, but all the, once again, it's got to be more than attendance. It's got to be real assessments. And, and everything, I believe the state, from the governor, lieutenant governor, the speaker, the um, TEA commissioner, are all on board with that. Let local, let locals develop assessments going forward, or at least having 50% of it. We've talked a little bit about House Bill 3. I'm just going to ask you, and I first want to tell you, this is my 34th year in education. I've never seen a bill passed that impacted someone's livelihood like that raised it for teachers this year, so I want to thank you for that. I appreciate that. Um, is House Bill 3 sustainable with that kind of funding tied to it? Well, and you know, that frankly is the best question of the day. We were able to put $11.5 billion into House Bill 3, and once again, five, um, five billion of that went to property tax relief. And we were able to come up with the money because frankly our sales tax receipts were up extraordinarily high and at the end we even got another 500 million was a bump and I, I personally believe it came from the rebuilding the Gulf Coast after Hurricane Harvey I don't expect that money will be there going forward I think uh, we've already went we've already changed to current year values we talked about that that put on about two billion dollars that will be there sustainable in going back through the system listen when we did the school finance commission the entire um, commission was broke down into three subgroups. We had expenditures, outcomes, and revenues. And obviously outcomes is what does the state want to see for investment. Expenditures are how, how will the state spend the money. And then revenues. Well, my argument was if the other two, if, if you don't have revenues, why are we even talking about the other two? We had 38 recommendations to the legislature which crafted House Bill 3. No recommendation on revenue was given other than spend more money. That was it. There was a lot of recommendations out there. You know, you saw during the session there was a, a slight push to raise sales tax. And I don't know, I mean, I, I asked the room, how many of you, if you could lower your property taxes and fund your schools, would take an increase in sales tax? Yeah. About half of them, yeah. I mean, and I would say that is about average on who agrees with it. If you own property at all, then obviously your your mind, in my mind personally, is sales tax is more fair. It just is. And sales tax, because 60% of the state's revenue comes from sales tax. That is the easiest way to continually sustain public education is raise sales tax. You get on a little slippery slope when you start dedicating funds because now you've got to continue that funding source or a future legislature's hands are tied. Um, I may, may not be there when that happens. I think sustainable funding is the right thing to see, do, even, even with that said. Listen, when I came to the Texas House, I came in on the heels of a session where public education was cut five and a half billion dollars. There were 43 freshmen in that incoming class, and that was the number one reason we were elected was that five and a half billion dollar cut. Right now, the state's doing great. We put that money in. I can see it going forward. Did the state give you a guarantee that it will not go down from there? Absolutely not. And and we are exploring ideas beyond sales tax. Please. On that, are we still one of the few states that don't tax groceries? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And you know that, and that's the thing. You know, sales tax doesn't have to be expanded to groceries. There's a number of things that are exempted from sales tax that aren't groceries that we we could explore. The problem with these little bitty things, it's like the sin tax. Something I talked about a lot. Let's put more tax on alcohol and cigarettes. Let's do that. It wouldn't raise enough money. It's just like the lottery. Remember the lottery you heard was going to pay for public ed? Well, the fact is, so public education is seventy billion dollars a year. The, I think the most money the lottery's ever grossed is three and a half billion. It was never going to pay for it. Now we all believe, or I, I certainly when I took that vote believed it. That's what I've been told. But that's that's not that's not feasible. If you're going to pay for public ed going forward, 
with one single thing, the only resource the state has today is sales tax without exploring a new tax. As a Republican, that's a bad word. I don't want to do that. But we've already pointed out we have 100,000 kids a year coming in. A lot of those kids don't speak English. They cost more to educate. We're, we're adding um, millions of people a year to our highways, to our to everything you want to talk about. And Texas needs a big old infrastructure. Basically, it's going to cost more money. Where we get it is, is going to come to the voter. And that's one great thing about Texas. We can't spend new money or tax or, or, or create a new revenue stream without asking the voters. So you are going to get an opportunity to decide if you want to pay for something or if you don't. What else? No? Well, thank you all. Uh, and if you do have a question other than schools, <laughs> or abortion. <laughs> I'll be glad to answer. Nope. I just want to thank you for caring about rural America. We appreciate you very much. And we thank you that you're an open voice for us and an open ear. Uh, I quite frankly don't vote for anybody just if I agree with everything they do or don't do. I need a good man up there, a good woman up there that uh, will try to do what's right. Uh, I just want to thank you because I believe you honestly try to do what's right. I thank you for saying that. And I want to say the last thing and then I'm getting out of here. So I have a ways to go to get home. <coughs> I, as, as your representative, am no different than if you knew me in my hometown. I'm the same guy. And my wife has made sure of that. I gave one speech that I wrote my whole life. And when I got done, I said, honey, how did I do? And she said, that was horrible. Don't you ever do it again? <laughs> I said, why not? And she said, it didn't even sound like you. When you get up and talk to people, you tell them what you think. You be honest. You say it from the heart. And I've always, always tried to do that. Um, you're not going to agree with me on everything. But what you need to know about me in this upcoming election is I'll never lie to you. My door's always open. Number two, and anything you want to say to me, come on. I got big shoulders. I, I'm good. But probably more importantly, I am pro-education. And I'm not pro-education because I'm an educator. I know how important that, that natural resource is to our state and particularly to also our small towns. We don't have an equally educated population. We, Mule Shoe doesn't survive. Canadian doesn't survive. And I choose to live here. So, and I'm going to be pro-business. And if that doesn't make me fit in somebody's stupid little box on whether or not I'm a conservative, then put your name on the ballot and let's have a race. Thank you very much.